of everyone attending here today. If you aren't familiar with this seminar series, we are from the University of Colorado and our Anschutz Medical Campus and a group called the Adult and Child Consortium for Health Outcomes Research and Delivery Science, or ACCORDS. We do health services, health outcomes, and implementation and dissemination research. We have multiple methodological cores and programs focused on service, um, including consultation, training, and grant development. We also offer um, education. And so this seminar series is one of our educational series, and this is our pragmatic research and health seminar series. It's associated with um, our conference, our pragmatic research and health conference that I'll tell you about in just a moment. Um, today's talk will be by Dr. Hilary Lum on implementing pragmatic advanced care planning interventions in the health system context. Um, and before I turn it over to Dr. Lum, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about our upcoming conference. Uh, this is year two of CopperCon, as we call it. This year's theme is implementation and conduct of pragmatic research, ensuring rigor and relevance in practice. It is a virtual conference and anywhere, anyone anywhere in the world can attend. Um, it is May 24th to the 26th from 10 to 3 p.m. Mountain Time each day. Um, and what you will be able to come away from CopperCon with is understanding how to apply elements of implementation science, stakeholder engagement, health equity, data science, informatics, biostatistics, and bioethics in the context of, um, of conducting pragmatic research. And go ahead and go to the next slide there. Registration is currently live for CopperCon. The registration fee is waived if you are a uh, employee of the University of Colorado, um, Anschutz campus, or any of the affiliated institutions of the CCTSI. And you can see if your institution's included there if you go to the CCTSI website. Um, there are two tracks, DNI science and biostats and data science. And we have a, a large number of keynote and plenary speakers planned. Um, these are just a few here. And we also have a call for poster abstracts currently open. And so if you'd like to present your work at CopperCon, um, please um, feel free to submit a poster abstract. We have three theme areas. One is pragmatic trial or pragmatic research examples, dissemination implementation science methods, or data science and biostats methods. Um, the abstract deadline is in just a few weeks, so March 29th. And please check out information at coppercon.com. And uh, also just wanted to let you know that we uh, will have an evaluation. We really hope that you'll help us understand um, both um, the value of these seminars as well as opportunities for other types of education you'd like to receive. And, and so here's the, the link to the evaluation. We'll be putting that in the chat and Jordan can put that in the chat right now, just so in case you need to leave early, um, please do that for us, it's really quick. And we are um, archiving this webinar. It'll be available on our Accords Education website. And if you just Google Accords Education, it should come up for you. All right, so now I will introduce today's speaker. Uh, Dr. Hilary Lum is an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Department of uh, Medicine and Division of Geriatric Medicine at the University of Colorado uh, in the, at the Institute's Medical Campus, as well as in the VA Geriatrics Research Education and, Clinic, and Clinical Center, the GREC. Uh, Dr. Lum is a geriatrician, palliative medicine physician, and health services researcher. Her career goal is to help older adults receive care that aligns with their preferences, especially during serious illnesses and end of life situations. A major focus of her work is to design effective interventions and implementation strategies to improve future care planning and primary palliative care for older adults with serious illnesses, including dementia. She works through geriatric primary care, telehealth, community partnerships, and population health-based approaches with health systems. And today she's going to be talking about implementing pragmatic advanced care planning interventions in the health system context. Uh, so this, it, as a part of our pragmatic research and health seminar series, we really emphasize figuring out how to work with real world healthcare system um, practices, personnel, workflows, data sources. And so this project is a really fantastic example of how to actually study um, both the effectiveness and implementation of an intervention within the context of existing resources and personnel um, in a health system. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Lim. Thanks so much, Dr. Kwan. It is really uh, a, a privilege to be able to join this seminar series and thank you all for logging on um, or perhaps for listening to the recording. I can tell from our those who have logged on that we're really a diverse audience of individuals interested in it advanced care planning, those who are engaged in advanced care planning research, and those who are intervention developers and implementation scientists. So I'm excited about our conversation today, um, and I look forward to the Q&A. So please do chat in or put in Q&A um, because we have saved time. I strive to save time. This is highly collaborative work, as all work is in engaging um, a healthcare system and seeking to partner well. So many thanks to my mentors, clinical partners, our team, and collaborators. This is a wonderful um, journey that we've been on since 2013, and I love that I get to share this story um, that um, Bethany asked me to share. You know, she really asked me to share what is the story of our advanced care planning journey in integrating new interventions into the UC Health system. Um, and I want to really highlight the story within the story about how you might even think about how you could engage multi-level stakeholders in your work um, and your sphere of influence. I, I'd like to uh, give a little commentary and open up the discussions we thought about in comparing opportunities from diverse funders and how do we uh, get this work done. And then I hope you also have opportunity to um, think about developing or refining public goods within the work that you do. So because we're a diverse audience, I'll start with a few basic slides of what is advanced care planning. It's a process that supports people at any age or stage of health in understanding and sharing their personal values, life goals, and preferences for future medical care. So we really hope that it's an upstream process that involves multiple aspects. Um, and that gives us lots of opportunity to think through what intervention helps when and where. Why does advanced care planning matter? 30% of older adults will need a decision maker to make decisions related to their medical care at some point, whether that's temporary related to delirium uh, associated perhaps with a procedure or surgery or hospitalization or illness, or it could be more of a ongoing need for assistance with decision making related to serious illness. We also know that those who have engaged in advanced care planning then do have fewer in-hospital deaths and more hospice use at the end of life. Also, we've heard from decision makers that it's helpful when advanced directives or advanced care planning conversations have happened in advance and that those decision makers are more likely to choose comfort care when an advanced directive has been completed. So in terms of then how do we uh, implement effective advanced care planning interventions into the healthcare system, we have to think through a number of difficult questions. Where should these conversations happen? Who should be involved? How can we collectively engage in this advanced care planning process? For myself, as I engaged on, in this journey, my particular interest was thinking about what interventions could fit into primary care um, as one example or could fit within the health system. So I was interested then in using existing evidence-based information or resources, and I'll uh, share some of those, rather than creating the resources them, themselves. A lot of our focus has been on then what interventions could fit within the healthcare system, their workflows and processes, and how then do we support and measure whether conversations or the results of conversations are happening. So advanced care planning is um, large, and I think there are multiple layers and levers that influence culture change to ultimately help us as communities, as families, as groups to be more open to advanced care planning conversations. Uh, this figure demonstrates how there are different opportunities through public engagement, education of multiple different stakeholders or groups, 
there's opportunity for system infrastructure, and we can apply research methods and quality improvement tools to determining whether some of these new interventions are actually working. So I hope throughout this uh, discussion today, you'll see threads and pieces of education, engagement, building sustainable system infrastructure, and then how we incorporated implementation science methods and other QI methods um, to determine whether we're actually making progress related to advanced care planning. So for those of us who are researchers and um, perhaps also those who are not, I wanted to just uh, give us a point of reference and how can we develop interventions and go about testing them. So here on the left, uh, the NIH stage model published by Lisa Onkin and colleagues um, suggests that we could do very initial preliminary work, stage zero, basic science research to understand the mechanisms of change by which an intervention might work. Then we could incorporate that information into stage one, where we're actually designing the intervention and refining it with stakeholder input. That then can lead to a stage two randomized control trial to test the efficacy of an intervention with a lot of oversight and a lot of support from a research context and perhaps research personnel. Stage three then is a efficacy test, but in community clinics or situations where we're increasingly using the existing resources from the healthcare system instead of having it be research personnel who are delivering the intervention. Stage four is effectiveness in the real world. So how well will an intervention work in the real world? Currently, we're seeing vaccine effectiveness testing as we're understanding COVID vaccine in the real world. Stage five is implementation and dissemination in this model. And you can see by the number of arrows here that this is highly iterative and ongoing. And I hope today through this discussion, you'll see that our work has had us um, exploring research questions in multiple parts of this stage model, and then also incorporating multiple pragmatic considerations. What do different stakeholders care about uh, and experience within our particular advanced care planning intervention? What is their feedback? What research questions matter to them? Or perhaps even questions more broadly, if I'm speaking from a funder's perspective. I've been funded by funders who don't fund research per se. So then how still can we answer questions and advance knowledge that is not in the context of a research study? The overall goal is a real world intervention. So considering how does this fit for people who are using it, um, be they patients, family care partners, the clinic staff, um, and all of the operations that uh, goes into having an intervention be sustainable in the real world. We hope to be able to use accessible data that is um, as low burden as possible for us to collect. So that gives us more opportunity, hopefully, to be able to continue to understand the impact of our intervention, uh, even when we're not doing it with a lot of research personnel to collect the data. All of this is in an ongoing process of reflection and adaptation. Um, and I'll uh, also share some of the next steps we have related to ad adapting some of our interventions. So this is background and uh, to hopefully provide some context of this pragmatic research journey that we are on. So the first example, I'm gonna talk through three different examples is primary care group visits. So thinking through sort of that stage zero, what is the science behind the advanced care planning group visit? Our purpose that we set out to achieve was to develop an advanced care planning group visit intervention to engage patients in advanced care planning as a health behavior. So perhaps similar to a goal for weight loss or tobacco cessation um, or diabetes management, all of which have existing group medical visit interventions, we then wanted to determine whether we could develop an advanced care planning 
group visit that could be delivered in the context of primary care for older adults. Um, I'll briefly say that our, our theory behind this is that the group dynamic is the special sauce that hearing from other patients, as well as clinic facilitators with some advanced care planning knowledge, impacts personal attitudes and helps with learning and influences behavior change, ultimately leading to advanced care planning conversations, documentation, and other actions. Um, some of the uh, intervention we've named as ENACT, engaging in advanced care planning group visits. So I'm also going to take an opportunity here just to sort of give you the meta story or story within the story. Since 2013, this work has been supported by multiple funders. And so I'm showing you here that different funders had different priorities, and we then leveraged that for uh, opportunity for multiple uh, aspects of what we hope to achieve. So we first started in 2013 with the Colorado Health Foundation. They do not uh, fund research. So this was framed initially as a quality improvement initiative to determine whether we could implement the group visit uh, whether older adults would participate, and what would the group look like? What sort of scripting and care processes and data collection um, to understand feedback from participants um, would be possible? So that was a two-year grant, um, and then that led to funding from the National Palliative Care Research Center, and that was an opportunity to really dig deep and refine the intervention with input from multiple stakeholders, both people who had participated in the initial quality improvement group visits, as well as input from um, clinic leaders and other advanced care planning researchers to help us refine for the intervention that we hope to test for a real world space. That led to development of the implementation manual um, and supported our next grant. So then the third grant that we were able to receive was from the National Institute on Aging. And this is a career development award, a four year award that gave us opportunity to conduct a randomized control trial, and I'll share the results from that. It also gave us opportunity to develop a recruitment video and think through some of the other public goods that we want to contribute from this study. Related to adapting this intervention, uh, also from the National Institute on Aging, there are Alzheimer's disease supplements to understand um, how we can advance the care of individuals with dementia and cognitive impairment. And we were able to think through, you know, is it feasible to develop a group visit that helps individuals with cognitive impairment? So that's a little bit of an overview of where we're going. And I'm happy to take questions of how we made decisions and framed our overall goal of developing this advanced care planning group visit to align with the opportunities from particular funders. So now taking us back to sort of beginning of 2013, as we're thinking about what can this group visit model look like, we based it on two different theories, collaborative learning theory, which is a fancy way of saying that the group dynamics for learning are supported through learning being a social process, the diversity of experiences that learners bring um, to their to the group, and also the different ways that they like to learn. So we incorporated written materials, video materials, Q&A sessions, and a lot of interaction with storytelling. And then also the individuals um, are experts in their own experience alongside the factual information that the medical facilitators have. So we really sought to highlight the expertise of the individual and um, their opportunity to think through what's best for them. Advanced care planning behavior change theory is um, also uh, important in this group visit. And I'll summarize it in saying that we hope that individuals will take a next step, will set their own personal goal for what's right for them in moving around this cycle of perhaps not yet being ready to think about advanced care planning through to uh, preparing for it, 
taking an action and, or even maintaining an action. So uh, then, then thinking through as we put this into practice as a, initially a quality improvement um, in, initiative and collected a lot of information through recording the group visits and collecting uh, interviews uh, three to seven days after someone participated in the group to hear their feedback, that helped us refine our intervention components, which are summarized here on this uh, graph, that we really want to make sure that this uh, group includes interactive conversations, education and support through the group dynamics, has goal setting as a core component, um, and then also from a sustainability perspective and integration into primary care clinic is following the outline for group medical visits, uh, that outpatient billing is possible and that the documentation is integrated into the electronic health record so that it's available to other practitioners um, who are interested in the person's advanced care planning thoughts. Uh, here's a schematic of what the group visits look like. So we have two sessions that are one month apart. Each session is two hours. Um, they occur in a clinic conference room. We design them to be approximately eight to 10 participants and facilitated by two different members of the healthcare team so that there are different interprofessional perspectives. And in our pilot, this was led by myself as a physician and our social worker, but certainly could be any uh, provider who has ability to bill for an outpatient visit. And then also another clinic provider who has specific attention to ability to facilitate the group dynamics and uh, help with rapport building. Um, in terms of fitting group visits into the clinic setting, there's a check-in process where medical assistants are engaged in assisting with vital sign measurement and a brief check-in process that includes medication review and any health status changes. Those things happen in the first 30 minutes. And then once everyone is arrived, we move to the clinic conference room and spend about an hour and a half with an opportunity for introductions, rapport building. If it's the second visit, following up on um, progress on the goal that was set. And then we have facilitated advanced care planning discussion um, related to topics that we heard were important for us to cover in these two sessions. As I mentioned, we use evidence-based resources that are readily available in English and Spanish, um, including the Conversation Starter Kit, Colorado-specific advanced directives that are easy to use, and Pre Rebecca Sidori's Prepare for Your Care videos. We don't show the whole set, but focus really in on one aspect. Um, so, from a lot of um, iterative input from our stakeholders and reviewing what happened in our first quality improvement experience, we really saw these core advanced care planning discussion topics rising to the surface being consistent. The importance of values clarification, equipping individuals and hearing their struggles related to having ongoing conversations with the people who are important to them, including family members, friends, or healthcare providers. A third topic is how to choose a surrogate decision maker. And we introduce the topic of whether someone wants to give a certain amount of flexibility to that decision maker. And that's where we tie to Rebecca Sidori's flexibility content from her evidence-based intervention. We also spend time talking about advanced directives, knowing that many people really perceive that advanced correct advanced care planning is about the forms and the documentation. So we do want to uh, talk about the importance of advanced directives and their role in this full process of advanced care planning. We also spend time talking about common medical treatment options uh, and try to equip individuals with an approach for shared decision making, thinking about the risks the benefits and the burdens of whatever that future discussion and uh, decision may be. We also end up talking about palliative care 
hospice, CPR, um, and other aspects of life-sustaining treatment, including sometimes discussing the Colorado Medical Order for Scope of Treatment, which is part of the National Pulse um, form. So I mentioned that we gathered some input afterwards in terms of evaluation interviews. And so I wanted to share a perspective from a participant on acceptability and usability of the group. They expressed their experiences and put me at ease to realize that there are people out there who have the same thoughts as I do um, sitting around this table. And they are in the same situations that I am in, where their loved ones cannot bear talking about the subject, cannot bear talking about advanced care planning. So it gave me encouragement to find a way to encourage my loved ones to listen to what I have to say. So you can hear a little bit of the increased self-efficacy uh, that the participant had after participating in the group. We also um, did an analysis of um, the participants' experience to understand if they really were at different places related to behavior change and readiness for participating in advanced care planning. I've uh, shown a few quotes here. So from an individual who we identified as perhaps in that pre-contemplation stage, this person said, I'm here primarily concerning the notifications of people in case of any type of emergency. Not yet thinking about advanced care planning necessarily for themselves. Contemplation, um, we thought that this person uh, was actively thinking through how much they wanted to engage in advanced care planning. They said, how do you get there though? You may have all these preconceived ideas that I just want to go when I'm ready. And then at the last minute, it is sort of like, hmm. So this person is starting to think through how much they even want to think about their advanced care planning preferences after having participated in the group. We also uh, identified individuals who were in a preparation phase. This person said, at this point, it seems like the next step is, on, is really on me, on us. So I'm gonna now shift a little bit to the randomized clinical trial that we did in the context of one um, primary care clinic. Uh, this was funded by the NIA as part of my career development award um, and you can see the schematic here where we are uh, seeking to understand the feasibility of recruitment. So how often are we able to recruit individuals uh, to this type of intervention? And then will they stay in the intervention? So I'm showing you our recruitment rates and our retention rates. We also want to know a little bit of how generalizable is the population at our clinic to other uh, populations that we might test this intervention in the future. And I'm going to show you the results. Um, but you can see that we enrolled individuals at time zero. We then collect their follow-up information at three months and six months after participating in the two-session advanced care planning group visit intervention. So here are our results. Um, there are two sets of results here. First, on the left-hand side, we looked at advanced care planning documents available in the electronic health record. So this is a very pragmatic outcome, in, including that we could collect it on everyone. Even if the person doesn't pick up the phone and we're not able to reach them, we're still able to look in their medical chart with their permission because they joined our study and identify at three, six, and 12 months whether they had an advanced directive or other type of advanced care planning document on file. And you can see in the black bar, uh, the ENACT group visits arm showed increased documentation um, at all of the time points compared to individuals in a control arm. And the control arm received mailed information uh, about advanced care planning, including the conversation starter kit and the Colorado Medical Durable Power of Attorney. On the right hand side, you can see that we also looked at whether individuals had chosen a medical decision maker. And you can see that among those again in the black bar who had participated in the ENACT group visits, we had very high rates of individuals who had said, you know, this is 
uh, who I would pick. Um, I'm orally telling you who I would pick. And then in the groups and clinically, we would encourage them to complete a medical durable power of attorney as a legal document when they are ready to, when they feel comfortable. So these were very encouraging results. Um, for those of you who are doing research and developing interventions, we um, really were looking at feasibility and acceptability. We were not powered to detect uh, efficacy, not powered to see a true effect size, um, and yet we did have um, sufficient numbers of people who had changes in their advanced care planning documentation and their choice of decision maker such that we do see a statistical difference. I also asked um, readiness questions from a validated advanced care planning engagement survey uh, created by Dr. Rebecca Sorori and colleagues. We asked four different questions which are listed here and you can see com um, a comparison of the rating scale, which was on a five-point rating scale from zero to five. The average scores for those in the control arm compared to those in the intervention group visit arm. And um, you can see for three of the four questions, um, individuals had more readiness to accomplish these actions, be it signing official papers about a medical decision maker, talking with that decision maker, and then fourth, signing official papers to put their wishes in writing, which we would consider a living will. Um, in terms of talking to your doctor about the kind of medical care you want, that wasn't statistically significant, though there is a trend uh, towards increase. I think this also gets back to the mechanisms of change. The group visit topics did not um, strongly emphasize or spend a lot of time on how to talk with your doctor. You know, we covered a lot of topics that were very person-centered and driven by the participants. And so um, it's not surprising to me that all of the actions don't increase in terms of readiness. Um, we want to give you a little feedback also about um, how individuals um, experience the group. So we again did interviews afterwards, this time of both um, patients as well as some of the primary care clinic staff to understand their perspectives on the acceptability of this group. So here a patient says, being there, being able to ask questions, hearing the other participants share was very meaningful. And a primary care practitioner said um, that even though I may be good at having advanced care planning conversations with my patient, I need them to talk with other people um, to continue to be motivated to engage in these conversations. It can help set the stage for them to go talk about it in the real world. So now, having shared some of our research findings, I wanna just also share sort of the, the meta story of what we're, we were engaging in as we were thinking about how can this be pragmatic research that um, has ongoing impact. As I mentioned, we spent some time creating a practice implementation manual that we have shared widely and is available um, on our website. We also are thinking about and have created online facilitator mo training modules so that as we expand this, we will have um, standardized opportunities for different facilitators to be trained, almost like flipping the classroom, that then when we are um, training for the intervention, we have a common starting place. We also realized that patient awareness is important, so we created a recruitment video um, uh, in partnership with the CCTSI and D2V dissemination cores and Dr. Bethany Kwan and uh, Dr. Jenna Reno. So we will show that to you soon because I think it really reflects how we spent some time thinking about um, public goods for uh, this group visit and how could we help equip clinics with the tools that they might need uh, for recruitment and having people participate. We also wanted to stay very close to our um, patients and their experience. So throughout the, um, this process, I've had engaged volunteers who named themselves peer partners 
and even um, then built a role for themselves within the group visit of being a, a volunteer within our hospital and participating to support the discussion of advanced care planning, sharing from their own personal lives. I've also put here Comprehensive Primary Care Plus as my reminder that we wanted to create um, this intervention in a way that would be supported by value-based care, perhaps align with quality metrics of CPC plus or primary care first, um, which is the new um, initiative to come. And it, it reminds us of the importance of having a financially viable model um, if we hope for it to be sustainable. So I'm going to stop my share and have Jordan share this video. Um, we, it's very short and we could see this being played um, in, um, say, a clinic room, or we've also been experimenting with sending it out via My Health Connection message, um, hoping that a person will click on it. And then when we follow up with them, they'll know a little bit more about uh, the group visit. So Jordan, if you're able to, please play it. Advanced care planning is a process of making decisions about your medical care if you can't speak for yourself. There are many reasons why this could happen, such as serious illness or injury. This can happen suddenly, even when you are healthy. What is most important to you if you become seriously ill? Who would speak for you if you couldn't speak for yourself? Your clinic has group visits designed to help you talk about advanced care planning and write your own advanced directive. An advanced directive is a document that helps make it clear what you want. Talking with a doctor and learning from others makes advanced care planning easier. How do you decide who you trust to speak for you? How do you write down what you want? How do you talk with your loved ones and your doctor? The magic of the group visit is the chance to share with others who are making similar decisions. You can ask questions and set your own goals for planning your future medical care. Julia is a patient who decided that it's time to get serious about advanced care planning. Her doctor recommended she join the advanced care planning group visits, where she met with clinic team members and other patients to talk about her questions and learn more. She was given easy to use resources that helped her make necessary decisions. The group visits were covered by her health insurance, so she paid the same as a normal office visit. Best of all, she was able to bring her husband and daughter so they could be involved. Julia felt that joining the group visit conversation helped her learn more, take a next step, and have peace of mind. By the end, both Julia's husband and daughter had also made their own plan. Make sure you have your plans in place and your wishes known. The group meets in the clinic with other patients like yourself. Family and friends can come with you. Talk to your doctor about how to sign up for the advanced care planning group visits and join the conversation. Planning for future medical care is for everyone. Join a group to take your next step. Thanks so much. And I will get us back over to our PowerPoint here. Um, so that was one example of a public good that we created. Um, and now I'm gonna shift and talk about some adaptations that we've been thinking about. So we are proposing a multi-site trial that will give us opportunity to uh, adapt the group visits to include individuals uh, who prefer the group in Spanish. So we're partnering with Denver Health to have individuals who are all Spanish speaking with Spanish speaking facilitators and Spanish um, or materials in Spanish. Also with Dr. Allison Wolf, in the time of COVID, we have been adapting the group visit to a, an entirely virtual um, interaction. And this is where we've also been testing whether use of the recruitment video uh, helps support uh, participation in that group. And then I'll briefly share about the Alzheimer's supplement to identify whether we were able to feasibly adapt the group visit uh, for individuals with cognitive impairment with my collaborator, Dr. Bree Betcher. 
So for those of you who are thinking about adaptation and how to engage stakeholders throughout a process, um, this is the study design that we proposed, where in the first aim, we wanted to have a longitudinal opportunity to ask for input from individuals with cognitive impairment and a study partner and a care partner. Um, and so those individuals participated in a focus group uh, over the year that met three times. Then in between, we did iterative refinement of different versions of the group visit. We did this in a research context, so this was no longer part of the clinical care because we were really trying to optimize and understand what resources made sense, what wording, what advanced care planning topics, um, and what would the overall impact and interest be of individuals with cognitive impairment uh, and their study partners. So um, we presented this at a poster at the initial CopraCon, and that's also a plug of would love for you to submit your work of how are you using different methods to engage stakeholders. Um, and we are um, I can just sort of share, you know, one challenge, not all things work out well. So uh, the, the group visit is able to be adapted um, in our experience and in our research um, evaluation to individuals with cognitive impairment, yet the feasibility of recruitment is even more difficult uh, than in primary care. And so I, that's, I think, a key limit to limitation to ultimately being able to ad adapt this and implement into neurology clinic or general primary care. So that's one summary finding. I'm going to switch gears in our last time to also talk about how we engage the health system through the patient portal. So as we were realizing that, you know, group visits are not going to work for everyone, there are opportunities via the patient portal. And in particular, this is where the funder, the Colorado Health Foundation, really influenced our thinking about potential opportunities. They were interested in a patient portal um, mediated patient engagement opportunity. And so we, in 2017, uh, recognized that there was no advanced care planning engagement material in My Health Connection, and that Colorado law does not require the medical durable power of attorney to be notarized or witnessed. And so therefore, an electronic signature on that MDPOA via the patient portal is something that um, is could be made available to patients. So we engaged a lot of different stakeholders to design for clinical use um, who are listed here. And this was not one-time engagement, but ongoing. Um, I really appreciate so much input and partnership, um, especially with our EPIC analysts. Um, and sometimes it feels like I had them on speed dial and they had me on speed dial. And it's that type of ongoing partnership to continue to adjust tools that are implemented into the electronic health record. It is certainly not um, one time and done, but is an opportunity for ongoing partnership. Um, we also really wanted to highlight patient stories and leadership testimony. So I'm sharing with you here a screenshot from our um, My Health Connection page. We were able to, uh, through the Colorado Health Foundation funding, uh, create a video that incorporated multiple stakeholder perspectives, including Liz Concordia, our uh, CEO. You know, she really was instrumental in the implementation of these advanced care planning tools. And in the video says, all of our providers and staff are focused on ensuring patients receive the very best care and experience. I've personally seen how important these conversations and documents are. So we um, really find that it's certainly a cultural uh, aspect of our care and emphasis here at UC Health, which gives us opportunity as researchers to design interventions that are sustainable. Um, so 
here's just an overview of the three implementation phases. Um, nothing happened in sort of a one time and everything was done. Um, most of this was in 2017. Uh, and then now we've had opportunity to see how it's been going over the past four years, getting a lot of patient feedback through semi-structured interviews and also observing how the patient portal has been used for submitting the medical durable power of attorney. Um, and as an example, we've tracked our usage data starting here in July of 2017, all the way up to last month, February 2021. And we saw initial uptake of averaging about uh, two to 300 people per month. And then very interestingly, in when the Colorado stay at home order related to COVID-19 happened in mid-March, we saw significant uptake uh, in use of the advanced care planning tools. Uh, and that has continued to increase. Uh, we've seen also uh, increase as more individuals have used my health connection for more reasons, including COVID testing and COVID vaccination. Um, so it's been an opportunity to provide access to advanced care planning in the portal. From a patient experience perspective, here's one example. Someone said, being able to go online and kind of do a little research myself, it made me more comfortable with it. And then I could bring up that kind of conversation. So I think it's absolutely a necessity to have it online to at least get people started. We This is an, also an example of a uh, postcard that we created in partnership with our UC Health Media team so that primary care clinics and other clinics can um, give this postcard out, could perhaps mail it to individuals uh, as a reminder or a trigger that these tools exist. Uh, it's also been important to give uh, raise awareness and give feedback and return information to our multiple key leaders and operational partners. So this is an example of our uh, infographic that we've created to give periodic updates of how we're doing and remind individuals of the opportunities to use the patient portal as part of clinical care. Uh, I think also I wanted to just share how advanced care planning uh, and the interventions we have done have fit into this larger system initiative. Um, as of 2020, our UC Health system has engaged in extraordinary partners in care with a five-year goal of having every person rece who receives care through UC Health have their goals of care assessed and documented annually. So it's been wonderful as I, as a researcher, have pursued interventions that can fit within our healthcare system and support the overall mission of our healthcare system, that then there's been opportunity for a top-down uh, impact also, where there are now initiatives focused on goals of care conversations. Um, we also heard from community stakeholders that there was a need for uh, public facing accessible advanced care planning resources. So that led us to creating Colorado Care Planning as a Colorado based website to provide information for advanced care planning. Um, we've hoped to provide a roadmap that can assist individuals with obtaining information. And this has really been iteratively refined as we get feedback from community members and other stakeholders um, and updated as new COVID-19 related advanced care planning resources come out, uh, et cetera, to hopefully be a lived um, a resource for our community. It's available at coloradocareplanning.org. And I also wanted to highlight that I've really appreciated the bi-directional conversation with the Center for Improving Healthcare, uh, Value in Healthcare. If any of you are Colorado-based and desire to be a participant with us in our, um, our sort of regional and our statewide advanced care planning stakeholder work group, we meet uh, every other month on a Thursday afternoon, and I have Kari DeGeneres' uh, email here, um, we would welcome you to join us in thinking through, you know, where are the ongoing needs and opportunities for advanced care planning here in Colorado.
So as I finish up, I want to highlight that there have been opportunities to engage with multiple voices, both formally and informally, in influencing our interventions. Thinking through the needs of multiple funders and the opportunities there has been critical um, over the years. And then um, trying to synthesize all of that input into uh, offering up uh, multiple different deliverables, whether it's videos or um, different handouts that can be returned to leaders to then spread the importance of advanced care planning or practical resources like Colorado Care Planning as a website. And I'm going to leave us uh, with these reflections uh, for those of you as researchers who might be thinking, you know, what aspect um, of this might I be able to take away. Uh, this is what I really am passionate about, this opportunity to be creative and create things that people can use, the opportunity to partner, especially collaborating with different people who have different perspectives, different needs, especially patients and community members and end users, the opportunity to, to listen, to really seek to understand what individuals needs are and then incorporate their input back into the research studies that we're doing and the tools that we're trying to develop. And I would encourage you to, to be persistent um, as we highlight the important things that you're doing related to um, your research need or as we've advocated for advanced care planning. We then have also seen that sometimes funders and healthcare systems and payers and policymakers will agree, and they will then use their levers to create opportunities to expand the reach um, and influence of the intervention even farther. So with that, thanks for your attention, and I'll pass it back over to Bethany. Thank you so much, Hillary. That was fantastic. Um, it's such a great story and so much work <laughs> clearly <laughs> has been involved in this. And we do have a number of questions and comments. Um, I can start with the simple ones. So what year did the ACP study begin? Um, we started back in 2013. 2013, so just a, just a little bit of a journey there. Um, and then a couple comments on the video. So glad you liked the video. And if you're at the University of Colorado, you can request a consultation with our dissemination service um, that helped that worked with Hillary and her team to create to create the video. And it's not currently available in Spanish, but I'm guessing that if you get funded to do that Spanish study, Spanish adaptation, then we would do that um, translation into Spanish, um, both from a, a cultural and language perspective. Um, okay, so. Let's see. So there were um, a couple of comments and questions around um, sort of the, you know, formality, the, um, you know, sort of issues or maybe dogmatic or like legal documents surrounding advanced care planning and wondering if you can talk about that just um, briefly because you did talk about that um, sort of later on about, you know, it's not just about the documents, but anything else you'd like to comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um... Advanced care planning is very complex and in the group visit, we've tried to both embrace that complexity and uh, be a place where individuals can ask those tough questions, ask whether it's more important to have a document or more important to have the conversation or what happens if my document is at one healthcare system but not at yours. And um, so both to, if people have um, legal or ethical um, questions about the formality of the documents to answer those questions, while also then creating space for um, uh, encouraging discussion and um, thought on how individuals might make advanced care planning practical in their own lives. Yeah, it's definitely a, a full conversation and there's much dialogue nationally and internationally about just these issues. Um, did you have any more objective outcomes of the extent to which um, participants in the group visits actually did those behaviors that you noted? So you have sort of intention or readiness, but any objective outcomes that you were able to collect? 
Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, we collected from the medical record whether individuals submitted new advanced care planning documents or had new identification of a decision maker. Um, the full advanced care planning engagement survey that has been validated by Dr. Sidori is able to measure 25 different actions. It goes alongside her readiness for it. Um, and we made a pragmatic choice of not asking actually the 118 survey items that are part of her engagement survey and instead just ask the four readiness questions. So I certainly agree with the comment that it's very, um, it's always a balance of understanding um, and, and choosing outcomes um, to understand the effect of our intervention, perhaps on multiple levels, while also being able to collect our data without burdening um, participants. What about, uh, are you able to get data from like the back end of the, of the chart or the portal or anything like that? Um, we are in the process of that. So there are um, some collaborators that I have that are especially looking at advanced care planning engagement via the patient portal. Um, and those are nice opportunities to think about, do people engage with the portal multiple times? Um, we know from a clinical perspective that people engage in multiple ways. They may ask a question to our centralized mailbox. They may submit their medical durable power of attorney. They may update that over time because each time they submit, um, there's language that revokes a prior document. Um, but yes, there's a lot of additional opportunity to learn more about how patients are engaging and then how that influences whether they talk with their uh, family member or talk with their healthcare provider um, or if it influences um, future decision making. Uh, we just have a, a few minutes left and there's a couple of questions here around um, like group dynamics and, and, and thinking about the homogeneity or, or heterogeneity of the participants, those who participate, um, as well as thinking about how it might be adapted for family meetings or family-based advanced care planning. So any thoughts about that, the group dynamics or the settings in which this is used? Yeah, I think this is a really key point that <clears throat> This is not a class. So even though sometimes patients will expect that it's a class that their clinic is offering, it's really incumbent on the facilitator. And we hope that some of the core components and skills that the facilitators have are, are to be able to facilitate as broad and diverse and inclusive um, of a conversation as, as possible. So of course, not pushing people if they don't want to share, but really inviting and creating space for different opinions um, and perspectives and experiences to be shared. I'll be honest, sometimes as a healthcare provider, we have our own biases and may not want certain uh, experiences to be shared. And it's really important from the group perspective to um, invite a lot of different perspectives and um, orient the group to learn um, from one another, even if they have different opinions and different cultural backgrounds or, and different um, priorities or places of readiness within advanced care planning. Um, and I think that addresses those two comments there. Um, and then one more um, question here, is the group visit billable? And if so, what CPT code do you use? And uh, yeah. what sort of documentation is required? Uh, thanks for that question. Um, we um, have done all of our group visits thus far prior to the most recent ENM changes, which happened in 2021. Um, Bethany, I also know that you do a number of group visits related to diabetes. So I think we are still currently evolving to make sure that our documentation reflects the visits that are happening. And typically, we have been able to bill without patient visit codes, often um, an ENM code of um, outpatient level three. 
Um, there's a lot of variability with that, and I'm happy to have any conversations with individuals who are thinking about how they would bill for these and how they would document. And on Colorado care planning, um, there is a section called Innovations in Advanced Care Planning, where we've posted a link to our um, 110 page implementation manual and we have some tip sheets to billing so happy to to share that with anyone. Well, thank you so much Hillary uh, this, this was really great and I, I hope everyone um, has had their appetite wet for pragmatic research and would consider attending CopperCon this year registration is open now. And um, this recording will be archived on our CORDS Education website. Anyone who registered for today will get an email following up with the link to the archives as soon as it's available. And so thanks everyone for attending and see you next time.